it's Debbie, and I am back with more True Crimes of Criminal Minds. I hope everybody is having a good week. I have not had a good week. I have been having editing issues, so this video is getting out late, and I apologize for that. If you've never been to my channel before, what I do is I watch an episode of Criminal Minds, and then I talk about a true crime case that either the show was based on the crime, the crime was mentioned in the show, or sometimes it's just a similar crime as the one in the show. Hi, returning viewers. Thanks for coming back. I love y'all. And let's go ahead and talk about the episode of Criminal Minds this week. And there's going to be some spoilers, not huge spoilers and it's not going to be long but there's going to be a spoiler so if you don't want to know the spoiler you can just skip ahead this week's episode is called the big game it's episode 14 of season two and in this episode the BAU thinks they're dealing with two or more unsubs but they soon realize that they're not dealing with more than one person they are dealing with one person with DID, Disassociative Identity Disorder. And the unsub, Tobias Hankel, is played by James Vanderbeek of Dawson's Creek fame. And he is so good. It's so believable that he has DID. It's such a good episode. And it also has a cliffhanger at the end. It's a two-part episode. So this week we're talking about Billy Milligan, the man with 24 personalities. He was the first person in U.S. history to be found not guilty by reason of insanity with a DID diagnosis. So let's go ahead and get started. Billy was born William Stanley Morrison on February 14, 1955 in Miami Beach, Florida. He was a Valentine's Day baby. That would be so cool. His mother was Dorothy Pauline Sands. She was originally from Lancaster, Ohio, and she married her high school sweetheart right after high school. The marriage didn't last for very long, and after the divorce, she moved to Miami where she worked as a singer. She moved in with a musician named Johnny Morrison, and he was still legally married to another woman, so they never got married, but they had three children. They had two sons, Jim and Billy, and a daughter named Kathy, and Billy was the middle child. Billy's dad, Johnny, had problems with depression, gambling, and alcohol. One time, Dorothy found him passed out with a bottle of scotch and a bottle, an empty bottle of sleeping pills on the floor. So he was hospitalized for depression and alcoholism, and he survived. However, he was successful in self-unaliving by carbon monoxide poisoning, by sitting in his car in the garage with the motor running, a hose from the tailpipe to the window of the car. That is so sad. After his death, Dorothy and the kids moved back to Lancaster, Ohio, where she remarried her first husband, Dick Jonas. Not Nick. Not that Jonas. Dick Jonas. That marriage lasted about a year. Billy was four when his dad died, and his first three personalities started coming out at age five. Christine, Sean, and No Name Boy. Christine was a three-year-old little girl that was originally an imaginary friend, and Sean was a deaf four-year-old. I can see how bringing out a deaf personality could happen because then you could just ignore everybody and be like, what? I didn't hear you. I'm deaf. I'm sorry if that's insensitive. I have a very morbid sense of humor. I don't know who No Name Boy is. He's not on the list of alternate personalities, and I'm thinking he may have been given a name at some point. There's a lot of names, y'all. A lot of names. 
After Dorothy's second divorce from her first husband, she met Chalmers Milligan, and they got married in Circleville, Ohio on October 27, 1963. Chalmers adopted all three kids and changed their names to Milligan. He had two daughters from a previous marriage, Chala, who was the same age as Billy, and another older daughter who was a nurse. His first wife divorced him for gross neglect. This guy, not a catch, y'all. Not a catch. Not a good husband and an even worse father. Chalmers was abusive to Billy and Jim. Billy more than Jim because he has a Billy. And during this abuse, more personalities would form. There was Adelana, a 19-year-old lesbian. Billy liked to help his mom in the kitchen, and his stepdad would beat him for acting like a girl. So, Adelana was formed so that he could help his mom in the kitchen and do women's work. I don't know how that fixed anything, because he's still a guy, even though that personality's female. I don't understand this whole thing. I had so much fun researching this because... It fascinated me. I still don't understand it, but it's fascinating. So one of the videos that I watched is Emma Kenny, I believe her name is. She's a psychologist in, in the UK. So I watched her video and she said that sometimes an offender will pick the most vulnerable child. It's the act of control that they get off on, not the number of people that they abuse. And a lot of times, siblings will defend the abusive parent because they've never been abused. And sometimes they don't even know about the abuse being done to their sibling. So they just, they don't believe it. They think, oh, you're just mad at dad or whatever, making it up. Like, they don't believe it's a true thing. But Billy's family did. They testified at his trial that it was torture living with Chalmers. And when Jim, Billy's older brother, threatened Chalmers with a knife after a violent episode, he left and he never went back to the family. Billy was hospitalized as a teenager with a diagnosis of hysterical neurosis with passive aggressive tendencies. Hysterical neurosis is a neurotic disorder characterized by violent emotional outbreaks and disturbances of sensory and motor functions. He tried to unalive himself when he was 16 years old, but one of his alters stopped it from happening by putting him to sleep. He said he'd been asleep for seven years prior to committing the crime. Disassociative Identity Disorder, formerly called Multiple Personality Disorder, is a mental health condition that is characterized by having two or more distinct personalities and memory gaps. It is a very rare diagnosis. Less than 1% of the population has it. And of that 1%, 95 to 98% of cases were caused by childhood abuse. When the core personality can't handle the abuse, like this is the core, and then this personality splinters out into other personalities. And it's to protect the core personality. And each altar is formed for a specific purpose. And people with DID are usually not violent. But this case is a little different. Billy was arrested in 1975 for robbery and grape. He served two years in Lebanon Correctional Facility and was paroled in 1977. Also in 1977, he was arrested for three counts of kidnapping, three counts of aggravated robbery, and four counts of grape. He held the women at gunpoint and he abducted some of the women from their cars and one of the victim's cars had his fingerprint in it. Another victim was able to identify him from his mugshot. When they got the search warrant for his house, they found women's driver's license, trophies that he had taken from them, like jewelry and stuff, their credit cards, weapons, and 
running clothes, I think they said. And I don't know where the running clothes fit in unless maybe the women testified that he was wearing running clothes. I don't know. But anyways, they found a whole bunch of stuff that linked him directly to the crimes. He was immediately sent to Ohio State Penitentiary because having a weapon was a parole violation. Um, isn't committing another crime a parole violation? Because, like, every website, every video that I watched, it made a big deal about him immediately going back to prison because of the weapon being a parole violation. Committing crimes are parole violation, too. Unless I'm wrong. I don't think I am. <laughs> anyway, Billy claimed that it wasn't him. It was his alternate personalities. Reagan, a 23-year-old Yugoslavian man, was the one doing the robberies. And Adelana, the 19-year-old lesbian, was the one doing the grapes. Yeah, I know. That's weird. <laughs> he had no memory whatsoever of the crime. Adelana had no memory of the robberies. And Reagan had no memories of the grapes. OSU Police Investigation Supervisor Elliot Boxerbaum recalled, I couldn't tell you what was going on, but it was like I was talking to different people at different times. One of his victims testified in court that sometimes he would act like a child and he would kind of switch back and forth between a child and a gay woman. It seemed like he was acting like a gay woman. And she actually said this in the trial. Billy was also really chatty while he was doing his thing. He would tell them that he was a wealthy businessman with a Maserati or that after the attack, he was going to jet off to Tangiers and also that he had killed like three people. And he told one of the victims to tell them that it was Carlos the Jackal. Billy was examined by multiple psychiatrists and psychologists. Dr. Willis C. Driscoll diagnosed him with acute schizophrenia. And it is thought that his real father was also schizophrenic. But then he saw Dr. Dorothy Turner, who diagnosed him with DID. Billy was found not guilty by reason of insanity and was sent to the Central Ohio Psychiatric Hospital. He was treated like a celebrity even allowed to be out on furlough without supervision because that's a good idea yeah let's let the dude that does crimes against women just roam around unsupervised but they revoked that privilege praise the lord not not praise the lord because of what he did but praise the lord because they revoked that privilege he committed a crime against a female patient and that privilege was revoked. He was sent to a series of state-run hospitals. He was housed in Lima, Dayton, Columbus, and Athens psychiatric facilities. On July 4th, Independence Day, and I don't think this is a coincidence. I really, really don't. I think it's funny. <laughs> On Independence Day, 1986, he escaped. He escaped from Central Ohio Psychiatric Hospital. And then he went to Bellingham, Washington, all the way on the other side of the country, and he started a hot tub business. <laughs> so this man breaks, breaks out of a mental hospital, and then he starts a successful hot tub business. <laughs> this is such a weird case, y'all. So anyway, <laughs> he was able to get papers that said his name was Christopher Carr. And he moved in with a man named Michael Madden. And I don't know if this was a relationship, a business partner thing, or if they were just roommates. But for some reason, they had a joint bank account. And Billy was actually cashing Michael's disability checks. Michael Pierce Madden was last seen on September 15, 1986, arguing with a man that fit Billy's description. He has never been seen again. Then Billy left Washington State and went to Florida, where, whoa, we caught him, and they sent him back to the hospital. 
Why do they keep coming to Florida? Bundy, Warnos, Henry Lee Lucas, Bill, why? We catch them. <laughs> if you, I mean, look at Bundy. State to state to state to state, Florida. Boom. <laughs> like, why are you guys coming here? We're just going to catch you. Billy's alternate personalities did not come out when he was in a relationship with someone. They only came out during stressful or dangerous situations. And let me tell you, Billy had some girlfriends. He had girlfriends in the hospital. He even had relationships with staff members. That is so unethical. You should never have a personal relationship with any of your patients. That's just wrong. Especially psychiatric patients. He even got married, briefly, to the sister of one of the patients at the hospital. And that marriage lasted about 50 days. Doctors eventually believed that they had been able to fuse all of his 24 personalities into one. He was released from the hospital in 1988. On August 1st, 1991, he was officially released from the Ohio Mental Health System. He moved to California and started a production company called, this is so clever, Stormy Life Productions. Because he had a stormy life. I think that is such a cool name. He was in talks with James Cameron of Avatar Terminator fame, David Fincher, and Joel Schumacher to make a film about his life, and Leonardo DiCaprio was set to play him. He would have been really good in this role. Have you guys seen Shutter Island? You need to see Shutter Island. It's amazing. The deal for the movie fell through, and it never got made. Billy's altars were artistic. He had three that did paintings, and they're gorgeous. They're absolutely beautiful. The potential this guy had if he didn't have DID is amazing. So he got quite a bit of money. Like he sold his paintings for thousands of dollars. But because he got cured and released, he now has a hospital bill. $450,000. So he, I think it was around 170000 that he was able to pay them. But he was bankrupt after that. So I don't think they've ever seen any of the money other than the first 170000 After Billy stint in Hollywood trying to get his story out, he disappeared for a while. And no one knew where he was or what he was doing. Does that make anybody else nervous? That makes me nervous. Because what the heck? Nobody knew where he was. What if he was sick again and doing stuff he shouldn't be doing? Anyway, he eventually ended up living with his sister. I guess he showed up at her house one day and was like, Hey, sis, can I stay? I don't know. But then she eventually bought him a trailer to live in. I think it was on her property, too. And then Billy, poor Billy, this had such a bad life. He got cancer. And he was put into a nursing home in Ohio, and he died on December 12th, 2014, when he was 59 years old. Okay, so let's talk about his alternate personalities. Now, try not to get confused, because this is confusing as all get out. So I'm going to talk about these alternate personalities as if they're real people because that's the way every website, every video I watch describe them and it's the way Billy described them. He called them his family. And he called the place where they took control the spot. And there were two types of alternate personalities. One was desirables and the other one was undesirables. Imagine a completely, totally dark room. Full of people. Well, it's dark in there, so you can't see anyone. They're all in the shadows. A big spotlight. Boom, right in the middle of the room. That's the spot. That's where the personalities would go to take control. In the spotlight. And then the other personalities would be around that one. And then the undesirables, they would be banished to the shadows. So they rarely ever got the spot, and they were in the shadows all the time. So there were 10 personalities that were desirables, and these are the 10 personalities 
that were known at the time of the trial. And then there are 13 personalities that are undesirable. Arthur was the most dominant. He controlled the chaos. He controlled who occupied the spot. He was British, spoke with an accent, and was very intelligent. This is one of the things that confuses me. How do you know stuff at a young age that you have no way of knowing? Because Arthur knew things about science and medicine, and he specialized in hematology, which is the study of the diseases of the blood. And he would come out whenever intellectual or logical thinking was required, and he was even compared to Mr. Spock from Star Trek because he was so logical. Reagan Vadaskovinich, he was a 23-year-old Yugoslavian communist, and he wrote and spoke fluent Serbian. How? How did Billy learn all these accents and languages? I don't get it. Reagan was very strong physically. When Reagan was in the spot, Billy was super strong, and Reagan's purpose was to protect the family, and he protected Billy when they were in jail. Alan, he was the con man and the manipulator of the group. He was able to talk them out of trouble that the others got them into. And he was good at concealing the alternate personalities. He played the drums. He smoked. He was the only one that smoked. The only addiction to nicotine was Alan. None of the others smoked. He painted portraits. He was right-handed, and all the others were left-handed. Then there's Tommy, and Tommy was the escape artist. I'm thinking that Tommy was the one that broke them out of the hospital. He was a teenage tech expert, and he could get out of straight jackets and pick any lot. He protected them from being held against their will. So where was he the two years that they were in jail? But I think he had to have been the one that broke him out of the middle hospital. Arthur would encourage him by buying him straight jackets and locks to practice with. He played tenor sax and he painted landscapes. He was often confused with Alan. Well, Duh, they look exactly alike because they're the same person. Danny was the shrinking violet. He was fearful of men. And the reason he was afraid of men was because of the abuse by the stepfather. He was also afraid of dirt. Now, I'm not talking like germaphobe dirt. I'm talking dirt, soil, actual ground that you dig up. Because his stepfather had Billy dig his own grave one time and buried him alive and obviously he got out i don't know how he got out i didn't see that anywhere i'm assuming that his mom or his siblings found him and dug him out danny was also an artist and he painted still lifes david david was an eight-year-old little boy and i think that is kind of billy at eight years old named him david he was the keeper of the pain. That just breaks my heart. That makes me want to hug the little eight-year-old boy that he was. It's just so sad. He was in a bathroom, a public bathroom one time, and there was a drag queen in the men's restroom, and it confused him. So when this happened, Reagan took control and beat the poor man up. I don't like it. That's horrible. Christine, she was the cheerful child. She was three years old, and she was originally an imaginary friend. She was dyslexic, and Arthur taught her how to read and write. And she had a special bond with Reagan. Christopher was Christine's older brother. How does that work? I've never heard of anybody having sibling alternate personalities before. And Christopher played the harmonica. Are you seeing a theme here? Like, some of these altars were extremely creative. Like, Billy had such potential. He was musical. He was artistic. Yet, 
All of these attributes were given to his alternate personalities because of what his stepfather had done to him as a child. Anna Lana. We already talked about her a little bit. She's a 19-year-old lesbian, and she did the grapes because she wanted to feel close to someone. She always craved attention and love. But that's not why you grape someone. It's not about love and connection. It's about power and control. Whatever. I don't know. <laughs> Just reporting what I read. She cooked and cleaned for the family. She did the women's work. And she could wish away anyone in the spot and take control. And the others did not know that she had this ability or that she had committed any crimes. If they had known, she would have been banished to the shadows herself. But those were the desirables. Here's the undesirables. These personalities were suppressed by Arthur because they possessed undesirable traits. Philip. He was a small-time criminal thug. He had a thick Brooklyn accent, and he would carry out crimes with another personality named Kevin. Kevin would plan robberies and then not follow through because he just had no ambition. He wasn't as motivated or as smart as Philip, and they tended to do crimes together, and... They robbed the drag queen after Reagan beat him up in the bathroom. How did both Walters come out at the same time, though? Walters next. He was an Australian complete with accents, and he was a big game hunter. He was relegated to the shadows and deemed an undesirable because he shot a crow. And this scared the kids in the family. And only Reagan was allowed to have guns. So he got banished. April was referred to as the bitch. She was obsessed with killing Billy's stepdad. She even convinced Reagan to kill him once. But then Arthur talked him out of it. She was created to deal with Billy's anger and was labeled an undesirable because she was dangerous. And she had a thick Boston accent. Next, we have Samuel. Samuel was an Orthodox Jew. And I read somewhere that Billy's biological father was Jewish. I don't know if that has anything to do with this alternate personality or not. But anyway, he was an Orthodox Jew, and he was the only altar that was religious or believed in God. He was only allowed the spot on Yom Kippur, which is the Jewish Day of Atonement. He was considered an undesirable because he would sell the other altars' paintings and keep the money for himself. Same person. I don't get it. <laughs> this is such a complex mental disorder, y'all. It just, there's no logic at all with it. None. It just, it's crazy. Next, we have Mark. He was the workhorse because he never complained. He would do anything anybody told him anything. He would blindly follow anyone that told him to do something. And he was deemed an undesirable because of that. Because he would blindly follow whether it was good for him or bad. He would just do what other people did. Steve was the egomaniac. And he claimed that he was not a fragment of Billy's core personality. He claimed that he was the actual core personality instead of Billy. And he was the one that would get them in trouble with the guards in prison. And I can see how that would happen. Having quite a few, unfortunately, egomaniacs in my life. I can see how that would get them into trouble. Lee was the practical joker. They ended up in solitary confinement due to a practical joke gone wrong. And I so want to know what that joke was. I couldn't find it anywhere. I want to know what landed them in solitary. Jason was the pressure valve, and he would have tantrums to release tensions, which actually works, y'all. I have this thing that I do when I'm super, super frustrated about something. I will just scream at the top of my lungs, and it does. It releases the tension, and then you kind of like relax a little bit, and then you can think straight to deal with whatever the problem is. I don't think that 
this was as therapeutic as the way I do it. But anyway, another personality named Jason, that was his pressure valve. Bobby. Bobby was the dreamer. He was always dreaming up things and plans to make them better, to earn money, to make the world a better place. But he had no ambition whatsoever to carry any of these plans out. So he was undesirable. Sean was undesirable because he was a deaf four-year-old child. He was an undesirable because of his disability, but also they didn't like that he made a buzzing noise with his mouth. He would feel the vibrations in his head, and he liked it, so he would make this buzzing noise, and the other alters did not like that. Martin, he was a snob from New York. He was good at getting things that he wanted, without actually putting any work into it. He would get other people to do it for him. He would get other people to do it for him. He would manipulate somebody to make them think that it was their idea to do something for him. And he claimed that he was a genius. If he could manipulate people, he was probably pretty smart. I don't know if he was really a genius or not. But he challenged Arthur. So he was deemed an undesirable because of that. Timothy, he kind of became an undesirable of his own free will. I mean, as much as an alternate personality has a free will. Because he was very childlike and he was a florist and his boss was a gay man that flirted with him and it frightened him. So he kind of just went into his own world back in the shadows and didn't come out anymore after that. And the last alternate, which I think this one must have been developed in the mental hospital because it has no function previously to it but I don't know I didn't read anywhere about that I'm just making assumptions so just an assumption could be totally wrong but the teacher helped achieve the fusion of all the personalities so the teacher would not have been needed earlier in life I don't know and the teacher remembered everything that the others did the teacher was the only one that knew everything that was going on all the time. This painting, this is an interesting painting. It is seven of his personalities. And he was asked to paint them in therapy. And going left to right, Alan, Tommy, Arthur, Adelana. Adelana is holding Christine. And then Reagan is to Adelana's left, our right, and then Kevin. See what a good painter he was? He has a lot of really, really pretty paintings. There is still much discussion around this case to this day. I have so many questions. How does a child know how to do a different accent or speak different languages? How did he know things about science and medicine and hematology and technology? And I'm not saying that he faked it. I believe this is a real disorder, but I don't understand how you know a language without learning it. And his alters ranged from people with severe disabilities to people that were geniuses. How do you fake that? I, I just have so many questions. Like, how do you speak a foreign language that you don't know when you're eight? You didn't learn it. You just know it. How does that work? I don't know. I'm so confused. Netflix has a four-part documentary called Monsters Inside the 24 Faces of Billy Milligan. There's also a TV series on Apple TV about Billy's life, and it's called The Crowded Room. And Billy is played by Tom Holland. I think that one's a 10-part series. And there is also a book. I want to read this book. I've got a, from doing this YouTube channel, I've got a whole heck of a lot of books that I want to read now because a whole bunch of these cases were written up in a book. So this book was written by Daniel Keyes and it's called The Minds of Billy Million. And somebody also said that the movie Split is based on Billy, but I've seen that movie. It's a really good movie, but I don't think it's very similar at all to Billy's case. I think the only similarity is that they both had 24 personalities. 
But the movie's really good. I would recommend it. I don't know that it will clear up anything about DID or not, but it's a good movie. So guys, that's the story of Billy Milligan. I hope you got something out of it. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to like, subscribe, share, comment, all the youtube -y things. And let me know down in the comments what you think. Do you think it's a real disorder? Do you think justice was done? Do you think he was faking it? Let me know your, your thoughts down in the comments. And remember, be kind to people, love your family, and I will see you next time. Bye!